Hi everybody, Terrible Dactyl here again. Welcome to Jurassic Plastic. I'm here today with some of my oldest Carnegie friends. This is my personal collection of first generation Carnegie models. I thought I'd get them all together uh, for a little group picture just to kind of do a, a very quick overview and introduction of uh, what the first generation of Carnegie models are all about. Um, this is something that it's very hard to find information about online. One of the reasons I started my website, uh, carnegiecollection.blogspot.com, was to get the info about, uh, out about all these different variants. And um, I, I think they're very interesting. I didn't learn about these until, like, a couple of years ago, uh, I first saw these online. Uh, probably on like Dino Toy Forum or uh, Randy Knowles site or some other, uh, you know, sort of obscure um, collector's site. And I was a little uh, confused at first because I had never been aware of the fact that um, all the Carnegie Collection dinosaurs that I had when I was a kid were not really the originals, that there was a, a very short-lived generation of, uh, you know, dinosaurs that are of the same or at least very similar molds but in completely different color schemes that had come out uh, before I started collecting them. Um, and so I started tracking them down, and I have a little bit of a collection now. I'm missing two. I believe I'm just missing two, which is the male Australopithecus and the Brachiosaurus, and technically also the original adult Apatosaurus, but I'll talk about that in a second. So how do we differentiate these? Well, it's pretty obvious, right? They've got much, much different paint schemes. This Allosaurus, for example, uh, is totally different than the familiar green and black one. It's the It's got this sort of weird, you know, yellowish um, splotching on it, some kind of a wash. Sometimes these old... Um, first generation models are referred to as gold wash. Um, I'm not sure 100% why. I think it's because a couple of them have maybe this weird yellowish kind of paint on them, although not really. I'm not sure where that name actually came from. I don't think it's applicable across the entire line, clearly. But what does really unite them is the fact that much like the 1996 versions of the Carnegie Collection, most of these are not actually fully painted. Let's take a look at the Stegosaurus here, and you can kind of see that this greenish, grayish plastic is actually the base color. And one of the ways you can tell that is looking at some paint wear here on the throat area. You can also tell that looking at some of this flashing. And quite a few of these models have this flashing. Flashing is just like this little bit of extra plastic that um, kind of filters through the edge of the mold. But the wash, uh, these all do kind of more have a paint wash. This is, doesn't, isn't like really solidly applied with a paintbrush. Uh, it looks like it was some kind of maybe runnier paint that was allowed to kind of brush through and accentuate the little wrinkles and scales on the sculpt here. So it's also got fewer um, paint applications. The number of colors overall are less. And overall, all of these, for the most part, have drabber colors than their later counterparts. Now, as far as I can tell, these were quickly replaced. I don't think that most of these were on the market for very long. Um, and the number that I have heard is, uh, the year that I have heard is 1990, for the time when these were finally replaced with their modern, uh, you know, the classic, what I refer to as the classic colors of the Carnegie collection. But there were intermediate colors. For example, there are these things that I've been referring to on my website as the catalog colors, where some of them had a little bit maybe extra, um, more subtly blended um, paint applications, and that may have been... Um, kind of coinciding with the fact that you see those in catalogs and collector's guides from that era. Um, I think maybe they kind of did a little bit of um, an extra special paint application for that year in 1989 to get those catalog photos done. 
and then replace them with um, both brighter and uh, more simplified paint applications. One other thing that really unites the first generation of Carnegie models is the rubberiness that all of these have. And almost all of them are very, very rubbery. Take a look at that. It's like really soft rubber. You can bend it every which way, including the crest, which I don't really want to do because of the glossy paint here. Um, the whole model is, you can even squeeze it. I know you can't really see it on the video, but if you squeeze this, you, it's got some give on it. Most of these are like that. You can see the Stegosaurus is very rubbery. Look at that. Anybody who's familiar with the Carnegie Collection Stegosaurus um, knows that later models, you would not be able to do this. Um, they did go between various different kinds of plastic, but uh, for the most part, uh, other than the ones with really thin parts like the Diplodocus and the Pteranodon, none of them really ever maintained this degree of rubbery plastic. And um, I don't know why that is. I wonder if it has something to do with the dreaded phthalates that Safari is um, very keen on advertising that their models now are phthalate free and that is a PVC softener so I wonder if these are just loaded down with those phthalates. Maybe not as bad as lead if you go back and see my lead video but I don't know. Wash your hands just in case maybe. I'm not too familiar with the effects of phthalates in toys. Uh, I think it's more about a developmental thing, which is why they don't want them in kids' toys, because, you know, much like lead, I'm assuming you would get them in your mouth by chewing on this. But uh, another interesting feature that may go along with the rubberiness of, of the material is that a lot of these have a mysterious hole. If I can focus on this little tail, the baby apato here, a mysterious little hole in the tip of the tail. Now, when I first got this one, for a second I thought that was a defect, but then I went back and checked some of the others. And look, it's in the base of the Allosaurus tail, too. Mysterious hole. And the Tyrannosaurus. Right there. Focus on that. There's your mysterious hole. Now, um, I'm guessing that's an artifact of the molding process and it probably is present on these rather than on the later models because of the different material maybe they were molding them differently um, that material may have been runnier which could also kind of explain some of the flashings that we see here are some flashings on the back of the Allosaurus I don't have any uh, very many flashings on my Triceratops well, this one is also slightly less rubbery you have a slightly less rubbery slight paint variant of the Stegosaurus too. So they may have been experimenting with various different textures and kinds of um, plastic during the beginning part of this line. But I'm guessing that this may be where the actual um, you know, needle or whatever kind of tool would go into the mold, inject the plastic all the way through the mold, and then be pulled out. And be for whatever reason, because of that material, it was um, left a little dent there. Now, I mentioned earlier uh, with the adult Apatosaurus, this is not technically the um, first Apatosaurus, I think. Uh, I've only seen very, very blurry photos of the original Apatosaurus. However, I don't think that my sample is original. First of all, it is not rubbery at all. And you can see on some of the spots here with missing paint that it is made of that same very very dark almost black um, hard unbendable plastic that as far as I have been able to figure out is characteristic of the 1989 releases most of the new models in 1989 were made of this really hard black PVC and then painted over and um, that's for the new models like the Smilodon, the Myasaura, the Protoceratops. However, um, as, uh, the, all of the original models were also 
released uh, in that kind of plastic between 1989 and 1990 before they all switched over to sort of a medium weight gray vinyl for the base plastic. This one also has some additional yellow on the feet, which I think brings this one more in line with the catalog version. And I would assume that this were the catalog version if it wasn't for the fully black head. The catalog one has a yellow head. And you may have seen a slightly more common, the baby Apatosaurus catalog version also has a black body and a yellow head and yellow feet. Um, now, I don't know if this predates the catalog version or if they kind of reverted to the original color scheme after a very short production run of the catalog version. Either of those are possible. I'm going to kind of lean towards the latter because I have heard anecdotally that this version of Apatosaurus was available still in stores a little bit later than some of the recolored versions, and it does seem to have a more um, 1990 um, type of stamp on the belly, you can see that the old belly stamp has been covered up, so this is not the original mold, or at least a slightly altered version of the original mold. This hasn't been retooled anywhere else, not nearly to the extent of some of the apatos that you'll see out there. Uh, and you can see that the mold lines don't quite line up on this one either, which I think would be the case if this were original. Um, also, I have heard that the original apato is very rubbery, just like this original baby Apato. And from the blurry photos that I have seen, it seems to have uh, more beige on the bottom. It may have been made of um, beige rubber, just like this one, and painted in basically the same paint scheme. Parasaurolophus is an interesting example of something that I've noticed on all of the first generation Carnegies, or at least most of them, is that at least some variants of these first gens have one spot of glossy paint thickly applied somewhere towards the head. On the Parasaurolophus, it's obviously the crest. There's another version of this Parasaurolophus knocking around that lacks the brown and just has a fully um, yellow crest or even un possibly unpainted in this area. I'm not totally clear on that. But you can see this glossy paint is prone to um, flaking a little bit. It's very different than the matte paint on most of the rest of the model. And you can see that also here on the Stegosaurus, where it's got this glossy whitish purple paint on the throat, but matte washed on paint everywhere else. You can see it on the baby Apato, matte washed on paint all over the body. And then, focus please, there we go, glossy um, brownish paint covering the face. And even on the Triceratops, you've got that glossy paint here applied to the horns. So I wonder if that was uh, a common feature of all or at least most of the original first gen Carnegie's. My Allosaurus does not have that. But once again, I'm wondering if maybe that was something that they just played around with for a very quick run of the production or whether that was the decision to stop applying that at the factory level, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm also not sure about how the different color schemes here were arrived at. That's one of the mysteries I'm trying to kind of work out is the original um, production of these. And Forrest Rogers had said that she comes up with the paint schemes for all the Carnegie's. She paints up a paint sample sends it off um, to Safari to send along to the factory when they're being produced. So did Forrest Rogers do three or four different versions of the T-Rex? Maybe she sent some options and the factories kind of just went through the options, produced them all and see which one worked the best on the finished model. Um, obviously there's something a little bit unideal about the paint that was used on these because of how easily it rubs off the model. You can see almost all of these have pretty decent paint rubs on them, at least somewhere. Um, it kind of chips, especially with the rubberiness. Um, and some of it just honestly looks a little wonky, like this is the original Australopithecus. And I'm not quite sure what they were going for here, but you can see the black paint for the hair kind of goes all the way down the back, like somebody at the factory or, or whoever painted up the 
the base model was going for like long hair or something. See, there's also black hair on the baby. There's just this gray wash over the beige body. Um, unlike later versions of this model that have a uh, fully brown body, more like fur, a little bit more ape-like. Um, it's kind of interesting. It looks almost like it's covered in dirt or caked in mud or something. And I don't know if that's intentional or if this is just a poorly executed version of whatever Forrest Rogers had painted up. They saw that this was not quite coming out the way that was intended, and so they changed up the paint job either at the factory level or had her repaint something. I don't really know how all this was happening. Um, but it's it's interesting to note that there are reports out there on some collector websites that Bullyland in Germany did the tooling for this first run of Carnegie Dinosaurs. I say that's interesting because the way that these are painted up is very much like the original Bullyland dinosaurs that had come out just a couple of years earlier. Just to give you an example, this is the Bullyland Stegosaurus. This is from 1985, and this was one of Bullyland's first dinosaur toys. You can see that it's very rubbery. It's made of green base plastic and it's got a darker grayish green wash over it with just a few highlights on the face. I don't know. I don't know if that's a coincidence. That was just something that was going on in the industry during the mid 80s. Or could it be that at least some of these early paint variants were actually being produced by Bullyland in some capacity? Uh, I really don't know, but I wonder if that might explain all the different varieties of uh, different color schemes and variants and all that stuff that's kind of packed into just a one or two year period. After they settled on those classic colors in around 1990, um, these pretty much stayed the same for over a decade until 2007 when they repainted some of these uh, original models. It's very interesting trying to look at little details and clues about these early first generation Carnegie's, the original molds were not used uh, after 1990. They retooled and apparently remolded almost all of these. For example, later versions of Allosaurus, you can see the mold line does not go across the chest. Same thing for T-Rex. T-Rex's mold line cut right across the chest, so they, they kind of molded these in two diagonal pieces that changed. They started molding them um, with a separate belly piece and then two halves on top. Uh, and they were also retooled. And the retoolings unfortunately lost a lot of the sculpt detail. You can see pictures on my website comparing um, very closely the very subtle shallow sculpts, um, lines, and fine details on some of these first generation models with the originals that honestly in terms of their sculpt look a lot cruder so even if you think the color schemes on these guys are nowhere near as nice as the newer ones they are very drab admittedly um, it's worth hunting down at least a couple of them just for the nicer sculpt the sculpts on these are the original sculpts and you cannot get closer to the prototype model that Forrest Rogers sculpted back in early 1988 then tracking down a couple of these uh, relatively rare first generation Carnegie models. So that's just my little introduction and primer for you. If you would like to learn more about the first generation Carnegie models definitely log into my website carnegiecollection.blogspot.com check out comparison pictures and a detailed breakdown of the differences uh, highlights and lowlights of the early Carnegie line. So thanks again for watching, and until next time, this is Terrible Dactyl for Jurassic Plastic.